So our next presenter will be Greg uh, Freeman. Greg is the Director of Business Development at QuickBond Polymers. Greg will provide some uh, considerations uh, for choosing a thin polymer overlay system for extending the life cycle of a bridge deck. So with that, I would like to hand Mike over to Greg. So that was a good segue, the construction quality uh, working group thing. And I want to thank, thank you, John and Bill and everybody at the National Center for Pavement Preservation for putting this together. I, I don't know if we've ever had this many folks uh, attending one of our presentations. So here, here I am, I'm going to talk about thin polymer overlay systems. And as I was putting this together, thinking back, I think it was about 1991 or 92 when I first sold some material for an overlay and had a chance to be on a project. And um, a lot has happened since then, and I've, I've learned a lot. And I guess that's what I'm going to do is to share a little bit of what I learned as it relates to making sure, you know, making the best choices so that if you're going to choose a thin overlay, that it works as well as you'd like it to work. There's a couple other items I wanted to just discuss as well. And, you know, why even choose a protective overlay? You know, why, why consider a bridge overlay as part of your preservation plan? A little bit of review as, as far as what an application might look like and the vari variability, how, how they can be installed. And the biggest thing I think that's most important, what are the variables that can affect the longevity of the thin polymer overlay? And that relates to, uh, on the design side, uh, and condition assessment and choosing the right location, having this specification, and we'll talk a little more about all that. And then at the end, I guess, kind of an overview of a, a checklist of some, some things to think about that aren't always considered. We'll start considering, you know, why even look at a uh, protective deck overlay treatment. And, and it starts with the fact that, personally, for me, I don't know if I've ever seen a bridge deck that didn't have at least some initial drying shrinkage cracks. If you look at American Con Concrete Institute ACI 204, it says that if if you have cracks wider than seven thousandths of an inch exposed to de-icing chemicals, then that should be some sort of a trigger for maintenance activity of some sort, meaning that you don't want moisture and de-icing chemicals and things like that uh, going into these types of cracks. Part of the reason has to do with you know what can happen with the corrosion of the reinforcing steel. And so, you know, as many as you know of you know that the way that this works is we have a certain amount of cover over the reinforcing steel. You have de-icing chemicals, chlorides, well, you know, atmospheric pollutants and, and things like that getting into cracks. And what happens is the pH of the concrete starts to lower around that reinforcing steel, starts out around 12 and a half, and that forms a passive protective layer around the steel. And once you start lowering that pH, um, you create an environment in which that that reinforcing steel can begin to corrode. And what happens there, I did reference a study that was done in Virginia a number of years ago where they were looking at epoxy coated rebar. They had 250 samples from 18 bridge decks and, and within four years, they started to see the corrosion of the steel within in the um, epoxy coating. And once you have a little nick in that epoxy coating, you have kind of a concentrated anode. It just takes off inside that, that coating and just the reinforcing starts to expand, as you can see. The other effect that, that isn't talked about quite as much, but this also contributes to the lowered pH of the concrete and eventually lowering it enough so that that passive protective layer around the steel is gone at some point, and that's carbonation, um, atmosphere, carbon dioxide, and other things. Uh, that will, you know, create that, that chemical reaction and lower the pH of the concrete. The other thing that we don't talk as much because typically on the front end, if you're looking at a uh, concrete mix design, you want to look at to see uh, if you have reactive aggregates. Sometimes they slip in and most commonly alkali silica reactivity or alkali carbonate reactivity and you'll have this crystalline growth pressure developing. You need moisture for that to happen. Chlorides uh, and de-icing chemicals make it worse, and it's hard to stop something like ASR in a bridge deck. Overlay treatments will slow it down. Um, there are other things you can do to slow it down, but I don't know that you can stop it. So hopefully you do your work up front, make sure we don't have reactive aggregates in our mix. That's critical 
since we're talking about thin overlays, most of the folks on this call are probably familiar with what they are. You have a polymer resin binder system that is put onto the bridge deck and you have a, a polish resistant aggregate that's broadcast into the surface. It's a two layer system. Sometimes it's called a thin polymer or an epoxy overlay or a multi-layer or a broom and seed overlay. It goes by many names, just a thin overlay. But your two layers adds up to about three eighths of an inch. It should be somewhat impermeable. We're gonna talk about all the reasons and all the variables that can affect why this may or may not last the intended life cycle. There, there's some really good studies out there. One that I keep referencing back to that was done from Missouri that had many, many years of looking at, you know, why do some of these overlays last 30 years and why do some of them only last one or two years? And uh, this is a really good information. And I think my observations pretty much lined up with theirs as well as some other studies that are out there. Overall, a thin overlay, it's very cost effective. It does protect the deck from the intrusion of de-icing chemicals and protect it from free thaw damage. And it gives you a polish resistant kind of a higher friction wearing course for the most part. That is if you put it on the right deck. Deck condition is really important, at least from what I see. And it, it's kind of like a perfect so, storm scenario. If, if you, a couple of the variables are a little bit off, then you, you're more prone to some of these failure mechanisms I'm gonna bring up a little bit. Surface prep is critical, just like any overlay system it's critical. And then construction methodology, it can vary quite a bit. And, and I'm gonna show you some pictures if you guys haven't been on, um, these overlay projects, and I've probably been on hundreds of them, you can see there's so many different ways in which a contractor will look at how they're gonna install these things, what, how they're gonna mix the material, how they're gonna apply it, how they're gonna consider surface prep and things like that. Like I said, one of the most important things is the condition of the deck. I like these photos because I'm not gonna mention the state that they chose about five bridges for the first trial. And, and they all look very similar to this one that's on the bottom left, as you can see. When you consider a thin polymer overlay, the biggest thing that needs to be kept in, in mind is that it does expand and contract at a higher rate than the deck, concrete deck itself. Maybe as many as four or five times faster. It's not a problem if the deck has good tensile strength. You don't have a lot of patching. We'll talk a little more about condition assessment, but it's real important. So if you look at this picture here, and I was on this bridge and I was on most of the bridges where many of these flows were taken. If you look at the bottom left, what happened is they came out there, a Bobcat mounted milling machine, which created a lot of vibration, probably a lot of micro cracking during the process, especially when it came in contact with the reinforcing steel. And as we would dr drag a chain around on this deck, the patching kept expanding and expanding and expanding. We knew that this deck concrete did not have what we thought would be 250 psi tensile strength, which is kind of an industry standard for concrete strength to retain a thin polymer overlay system for a good long time. We knew it didn't. And when they came and did all this patching, we knew we were setting ourselves up for a possible limited life cycle I went back to the state with a lot of photographs and shared with them why I thought that the condition assessment probably wasn't done properly and why if they wanted to consider using a thin polymer overlay system as part of their long-term bridge preservation plan, how they needed to reevaluate that. When it comes to a sound substrate, the things that I talked about, you know, if you see a lot of map cracking, corrosion of the reinforcing steel, which you have spalling, and then maybe you've done a lot of various repairs over the years, there's a lot of resources, and, and I'm not going to tell you if more than 5% of the deck is patched or more than 25% of the deck is patched. I could give you my opinion, but there's a lot of opinions. And there's some guidance out there. I'm, I'm going to share with you a pocket guide that was developed by the Federal Highway Bridge Preservation Expert Task Group at the end of this presentation, which offers some really good resources. And then patching needs to be compatible with the overlay. I can't tell you how many times I've seen a spall or a delamination on an overlay system, and it ends up being above a patch. You want to make sure that the patching is done properly and done well and with a, a good patch material, and you're not just dumping a bunch of water in there and trying to get in and out as fast as possible. 
Surface preparation, like I said, is really important. The main thing, we're gonna look at um, the proper profile. I'll talk about that in a second. You wanna remove the striping. Uh, there's a guy in the bottom right with a scarifier. You wanna sandblast any areas where the shot blaster can't reach. You wanna tape the joints and drains. You wanna air wash uh, with high, compressed, high, high pressure compressed air, probably over 150, 180 CFM. Make sure it's clean, uh, maybe oil filter, oil trap. And you wanna make sure you shot blast correctly. And I'll tell you a little bit about what that means. Uh, these ICR profiles are referenced often. You'll see the CSP profile referenced. Most people on this call may not have seen these, uh, these CSP chips that are provided by RC ICRI and you can order them online from their website. Most often you'll see a surface pre profile reference between a five and a seven, which is somewhat aggressive, but on a lot of old bridge decks, I'll walk on that bridge deck before it was ever profiled, and you'll see exposed aggregate, and it'll already be a five to seven. You wanna make sure that you shot blast, remove all contaminants, and open up the pore structure. That's critical. If you get on there with the shot blaster and you're just cruising that thing as fast as it will go, 5,000 square feet an hour, and you're bl blowing through real fast, we call that a brush blast. That is not shot blasting, and that will not remove all contaminants that will not open up the pore structure of the concrete. Best case scenario, you might luck out. In many cases, you might have problems a lot earlier than you expected. So this is critical. And we can talk all day about shot blasting, but we're gonna move on. And I'm gonna talk a little bit about staging and application. And though I will go back to defaulting to this pocket guide at the end, because it's a really good reference on the many, many ways in which any individual contractor can decide how they're gonna stage and then apply the material. Staging does matter. Uh, walking on the deck with rubber boots, walking in the wet resin, pushing the squeegees. If you look at the photo in the bottom left, even though uh, this particular project, I took a lot of photos from it because this contractor really kind of basically exhibited all of the best practices. One, say, one thing I'll note in this bottom left-hand photograph, you see the guy pushing down pretty hard. You don't have to push down that hard, um, especially since the serrations or notches in the squeegee get worn off in time. And as they get worn down, you push too hard, you're wearing them down faster, and you're also not putting the, enough resin binder down in there. Um, the photo on the top right, which the, the, the buckets on the right are white and the ones on the left are orange. The different components are in different colored buckets. I brought these guys two things because I did learn something after a couple of years. I brought them a, a jiffy mixer since they were doing this by hand, hand mixing, and this can be done by any maintenance crew, and it's really not hard. What I learned is that I always told them to bring a certain type of a mixer, bring a timer, a certain type of a faucet for if they're gonna use a drum or a tote, and if they were gonna use uh, a pump, I talked to them about making sure that the, the pump was mixing perfectly on ratio and um, mixing it long enough. But in the photo on the top right, you can't see in the photo, there was a timer that I brought and they stuck it right on the drum. They had a Jiffy style mixer because I brought it. They also, each of the guys had rubber gloves on and what they did, especially on a cool day, that the A component often is quite thick. And as they dump out the buckets, usually both at the same time, they might be a little more A in the bucket. And the guy there was scraping out the excess material. So they got all the A and all the B. They mixed it for three minutes. They washed it on a timer. It was really done well. Here's some other things that you can see. Um, this photo on the left, they're not only using um, a pneumatic broadcasting system for the aggregate. What they did is they had a pump prior to, to where the aggregate was being broadcast and they had a boom that, that went over the, guy that, the guys that were pumping and spreading the resin. So that accomplished one thing that you didn't have to walk in the resin and you didn't have to drive on top of the aggregate. Those are two considerations. If you look at the photo in the center on the bottom, they were pumping the material, but you can see the guys walking on it. And then what, what they were doing is they were gonna come behind it with an aggregate broadcaster and they were gonna drive, and they were gonna broadcast the aggregate in front of the spreader and drive across the deck. Now they had flat tires with, with no tread and they were not turning the wheels on that broadcaster. So that's acceptable, but it's nice not to have to drive or walk on it. If you're gonna walk on the resin, have spiked shoes, 
If you're gonna walk on the aggregate, don't twist your feet around and things like that. So it's always perfect not to walk on the resin or the aggregate if you can do it. And there's ways to do that. The top um, right photo, you can see it's being done uh, in an automated method. The truck was driving down, um, spreading the resin binder and dropping the aggregate and the whole thing was pretty much fully automated. And that's another consideration as well. Typically you wouldn't pull out a big truck like that on a small project. Most of those applications with full automation are done on a high friction surface treatment where some of the variables are more critical um, for, uh, and curves and things like that. After you're done with the first course and when it's fully cured, enough that you can get a sweeper and there's various ways of sweeping, uh, you sweep off the excess aggregate and you apply the resin binder again and you let it fully cure, sweep it again and you can get traffic on it uh, dependent upon the temperature. Temperature is a big factor and we're gonna talk about why making sure that the resin binder system is fully cured before you return it to traffic or before you even sweep off the aggregate on the first course. Quick overview, and one thing I didn't mention in the top left, if you do have any unsound concrete, and you may have some areas, that if you drag a chain, I often would have brought my own train, uh, chain along with me back in the day, because I'll ask if they did drag a chain and if they were prepared to do any patching, but just to make sure I would bring a chain and I would drag it around on the deck, and if you hear a hollow spot, um, you do want to make sure that you patch that and you patch it properly. You can see this patch was repaired. One thing they did is they removed concrete below the rebar. And that's always recommended, so at least so you can stick your fingers underneath there. And you've got some nice edges and it's a real rough profile. You got some shot blasting. You got a very basic method of mixing, spreading aggregate. You got a very basic method of spreading aggregate. Like I said, uh, any maintenance crew can learn how to do this. I can't tell you how many times 15 years ago, uh, I was on these bridges almost every day in the summer. I was training maintenance crews and prison crews how to do this. They've never done it sometimes. It was always fun. What can go wrong in the perfect scenario? These overlays are, work really well and they last a long time. So I'm gonna talk about when you're considering a thin bonded overlay, how do you make sure it's on a deck that's in good condition? How do you make sure that you have a good specification? How do you make sure you got a contractor that's going to do it properly? Because things like cracking, delamination, pitting, pinholing, spalling, improper curing early wear, and the polishing of the aggregate, those are all things that can go wrong. And we, want, we don't want those things to happen. And if you make the right decisions, they won't happen. This photo is an interesting photo. And like I said, many of these photos I took over the years. This particular photo is at a high elevation in the mountains. And this particular state, when they first started using thin overlays, they thought that three layers would be better than two. And it's like a rubber band. A thicker rubber band is not as flexible as a thin rubber band. And when you talk about expanding and contracting the coefficient of thermal expansion of the overlay being higher than the bridge deck, it's usually not too much of a problem if the deck is sound and solid. But if, it, if you put three layers, and it's not as flexible, and you got a lot of thermal cycling, and you're at high elevation and a lot of free stall and thermal cycling, this is what happened. And, and if you know, this is also interesting. Right around the coal joint, the center line is where this delamination started. These thin overlays or any type of overlay system wants to pull up. There's greater shear forces if you have a crack or let's say a coal join in a weak area, you have this unzipping effect. And it's a perfect example of that unzipping effect. There was a coal joint down the middle, the material is put down really thick, a lot of free stall. The surface paste should have been removed a little bit better. And the surface paste was weak enough that it pulled up. Uh, cracking can happen. If you have a really heavy traffic, long spans, the design uh, had a lot of movement in the deck. Uh, in areas, you know, I'm in Colorado right now, so we have a lot of freestyle, high elevations, the sun comes out, the clouds blow in, uh, temperatures change a lot. You have a lot of variables, so, so we want to be real careful if we're going to use thin overlays here in Colorado. Pitting and pinholing are not the same. Sometimes they're considered the same, but if you entrain air in the resin when you mix it, I've seen them take a uh, mix in a bucket and take that mixer and you plunge it down into the resin, you pull it up and it it looks like you're mixing it up like you're making a, a milkshake or something. 
And every time you mix that, take that mixer out of the resin binder, it just whips up a whole bunch of air in it and it turns into a froth. Well, not a good idea. And then you introduce uh, heavy dynamic truck traffic and chains and studded tires and freeze thaw conditions and long spans. You might get cracking. Pinholing can happen on a hot day. The, the resin binder is lower in viscosity. And when you have an aggregate thrown into that resin binder, you have this um, capillary action. It's like a wicking. The finer gradation of the aggregate, the more wicking action you're going to have. And you start wicking up more of that resin binder, and then you can have some pinholes. Uh, the other thing that can happen when it's cold is you have, have a lot of chains and studded tire traffic. And the resin binder becomes more brittle over the years and more brittle in cold temperatures. And heavy loads can, can impact the individual aggregates and you can have pop out aggregates and it appears as pitting over a period of time. The other thing is spalling. If your deck, especially if you have patching, uh, certain types of patching and the deck itself is not in good condition, you have a lot of thermal cycling. The overlay system is stronger than the deck, and it's the tug of war. And, and the overlay system, if it's done well, it's a good strong overlay, and it's going to pull up that um, it, weak areas if possible over the years. And that's you know it's wanting to do that if the deck's not in good condition. You want to make sure the resin is mixed at the proper ratio and mixed for a long time. Like I said, if these guys were mixing in buckets, I would make sure that they were mixing at the proper ratio and that they were mixing it and they had a timer. And I told the guys that were mixing, I go, you guys are the most important people. Maybe they weren't the most important, but I told them they were and they believed me and, and uh, they were real conscientious, hopefully, uh, especially if they were part of a maintenance crew and they were gonna have to come back and fix it down the road. Uh, they really bought in. Excessive wheel uh, wear on the wheel path, I'll talk quickly a little bit more about that, but heavy chain and studded tire traffic is a consideration and so is mixing and returning to traffic too early. You want to make sure it's fully cured. You start putting traffic on there and it starts breaking down the areas that are still cross-linking and you, then you put change tire traffic on there and you start wearing early and polishing of aggregate. Uh, some aggregates are more polish resistant than others. Here's a photo I took in Aspen, Colorado 15 or so years ago and, and there was a lot of heavy buses with chains and it was a cold day when this was installed. And so what happens on a cold day is that the part of the, the resin, the A component is typically thicker and it's harder to mix when it's thicker than the B. You have to maybe mix it longer. So you might want to precondition the, the, the A and lower the viscosity. And you want to let it uh, sit longer before you return it to traffic. And that might take longer than you think. And so this particular bridge deck, even though exposed to a lot of chains and buses with heavy chains, if if the material was mixed perfectly and, and cured, you may not have seen this early wear in the wheel path. Here's a great photo, and, and I have numerous photos like this because I learned my lesson and I wasn't on this project, but I got called to this project. And when I showed up and we had there was a tech rep on site, and I said to the tech rep, as soon as I walked up, before I even walked over to anybody, I go, you allowed them to mix in this funky looking mixing vessel. There was literally um, an axle running through this thing and it had all kinds of weird shapes. And they not only didn't have a, a Jiffy mixer or a real uh, liquid uh, polymer mixer, they had like a mortar mixer. They were not <laughs> mixing this material. And even more so, it was off ratio. Then they would dump this thing out and let it sit for a while. So what was left at the bottom would come out at the end. And if you see the photos on the right, that was the A component that would drip out at the very end, the last thing that would come out. That person, unfortunately, uh, was not with the company much longer, not, not because of this, but you know this should never have happened. I learned my lesson the hard way, and I was glad I learned it at some point. I think uh, often we learn our lessons the hard way. Uh, aggregate selection, there's a lot of good specifications out there. I see some states, and uh, numerous states, and some of which are probably on this call today, that have decided they're going to use calcine bauxite aggregate on all their thin polymer deck overlay systems. This started maybe six or actually actually eight or ten years ago, probably. Uh, maybe uh, one state in particular, they said, we're starting to see really low um, friction numbers 
on some of our thin overlays, especially on the interstate where we have really heavy traffic. Some of the aggregates and, you know, like especially uh, some of the things like Flint were prone, even though they were really good, durable, uh, high uh, polish resistant aggregates, when it came to heavy traffic over a number of years, they would polish. And with heavy traffic and, and ice and things in the winter, uh, they were seeing some a few crashes as it related to friction numbers. And that was mostly in the wheel path. So that they started the trend um, with using calcine bauxite, which is an incredibly polish resistant. Um, it's calcinated and heated up to 1800 centigrade and it's 87% aluminum oxide. So that's why it's really polish resistant. If you don't have a lot of traffic, and you're more rural, uh, you don't need calcine bauxite. It's very expensive. And even if you do use calcine bauxite, if you have heavy chains and studded tire traffic, it's not going to stop. The, the resin binder cannot hold up to studded tires forever. Um, it just can't. The calcine bauxite might help for a period of time, but it's not going to solve all the problems. Uh, thin polymer overlays work great. And they work really well, even if you do have some studded snow tire traffic and, and chain traffic, but they don't work forever. Shot blasting, that top left photo is the perfect example of what uh, a number of things that went wrong. There was, there's white curing compound. This was a new bridge deck. We noticed white curing compound was not shot blasted off that deck. You should shot blast that white curing compound off the deck. If that doesn't happen, then it's just going downhill from there. The second thing that, that we noticed, and you might not know, but that amber color, we weren't 100% convinced that the first layer of the, the thin polymer overlay was mixed a little bit off ratio. But when you picked it up, you could poke it with a key or a fingernail and you can see that that first layer was soft. The second layer was hard, it was fully cured. The first layer wasn't. So two things went wrong. It wasn't mixed very well. Uh, they were using a mortar type mixer and they, the, it was cold out there. Same thing. Two things that I talked about that, that need to be considered. So what are these problems and how we can we mitigate them? And there's a checklist, quality surface prep. Now, if you're writing specifications, you guys, please listen. And then if you're an inspector and if you're training your inspectors, please listen. And um, contractors often know what they're doing, and sometimes they got crew members that don't know, and sometimes they're busy, and low bidder doesn't always mean you're going to get the best job. Make sure your prep is done properly. Make sure that you don't have really heavy uh, truck traffic. You know, you may get good life cycle out of your thin overlay with very heavy traffic, but it's a consideration. Don't whip air into the, the resin. Keep the, the temperature range. Um, I'm not going to tell you the range. You know, there's a lot of good guidance out there, but conservative is better. Keep your temperature ranges more conservative and you're gonna have a better better chances, especially in, in wet, um, really cold climates. Make sure your deck is dry. Make sure the deck is sound and good condition. We talked about mixing. We talked about uh, heavy chain instead of snow tire traffic. We talked about the aggregates and continuous broadcasting of the aggregates. We like to make sure there's a wet line of the resin that you don't stop the resin in the aggregate. Keep going because if you stop the aggregate and the resin starts to set up, when you start back up, you may have like a little bald spot. And the other thing is just historically on shorter spans, I look at some of these studies, they're seeing a little bit better long-term life cycle um, on shorter spans, but that doesn't mean on long spans you won't get really good long life cycle. It's kind of a combination of all these factors. That's why I'm mentioning all these factors. The pocket guide uh, for the thin overlays, it's on the TSP2 website. You can print it as a, as a PDF. You can get it on your iPhone or Android. Just go under your apps, a section TPO, thin polymer, TP overlay, and it's great. It's a checklist. You can go through the whole checklist. Your inspector can do it. The contractor can do it. It's a great guide. Uh, I want to talk, talk about this so, so it gets used. And I don't have all day. So hopefully uh, you guys you know, download this and, and use it. The contents are really, you know, go through every aspect of this overlay. A lot of things that I didn't have time to touch on. Um, here's some contact information. If, if anyone has questions, please reach out. And I want to thank everybody. And, Thank you, all the other presenters as well. Um, 
And I hope we have a couple questions. The preceding was produced by the National Center for Pavement Preservation. More information can be found on the web at pavementpreservation.org. Additional support provided by Michigan State University.